All right, let's go ahead and get started. I know everybody's very busy. Welcome again to today's webinar. The title of today's webinar is Influencing Oracle Execution Plans, and we'll talk more about what we're going to go over here in just one moment. Again, my name is John Mullins. Um, you see, you should be able to see my screen, what I have up here. So I have a couple of web addresses up here for you and also my email address. So um, if you have any questions, it's best to kind of just send me questions via email based on the short amount of time that we have today. Um, so you can see that there on the screen at jmullins at themisinc.com. We also have our website up there, www.themisinc.com. And also, um, we do post uh, the slides and recorded webinars out on our website at themisinc.com slash webinars. And you can also go out to that address there and see any of our previous webinars that we um, have done as well. So we've done a number of other Oracle webinars, DB2 webinars, CICS, Java, so quite a few webinars that, that are out there. So uh, those are all free, so, so help yourself to those. Also, you can find, uh, follow us on Twitter at Themis Training. You can see that address there at the bottom of the screen there on the left. All right, let's go ahead and get started. I know everybody's busy, especially this time of, of year, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Thank you again for attending today. A little bit of stuff before we jump into the technical part of the presentation. Again, my name is John Mullins. I'm from Themis, Inc. Um, you can see my, again, my email address there on the screen, jmullins at themisinc.com. I've been using Oracle for quite a while now. I started it with Oracle version 5122 uh, when I worked at Boeing in Wichita, Kansas, supporting some of their military uh, aircraft uh, applications and worked there for 10 years and have worked for various consulting companies, training companies since then. I, I am an Oracle certified professional DBA and also certified technical trainer. So I recognize a lot of the attendees today, their names from previous webinars and from previous trainings. And it's good to see you again and good to have you back also. Uh, just a little bit about Themis, if you're not familiar with them. A lot of you have taken classes from Themis before, but just just a quick review, and then we'll talk about it at the very end as well. So classes in all kinds of flavors, whether they be Oracle, DB2, SQL Server, operating system type classes with Unix and Linux, programming type classes, Java, SQL, PL SQL, SQL PL, Lots of different classes there are available, so you can see all the class list out there at themasync.com. And again, you can get uh, copies of our recorded webinars out at themasync.com slash webinars. Here's a few of the classes that are kind of related to today's topic that we have up there. So we do offer an Oracle SQL optimization class for both developers and DBAs. And then we have uh, all kinds of SQL type classes from Introduction, introductory type classes up to advanced type classes, and then we do have performance tuning targeted for DBAs uh, specifically as well. All right, based on the short amount of time, we should jump right in here and, and see what we're going to talk about today. So um, today's topic being wanting to identify those influencing factors that could affect our SQL execution plans. All right. If you've attended any of our previous webinars out there, um, we've done webinars um, such as interpreting uh, execution plans. We've gone through execution plans step by step. We've gone into different types of features such as that might affect that, such as statistics and indexes. Uh, we've talked had various uh, webinars on various types of tuning topics. So again, go out to that themasync.com slash webinars and you'll see other webinars that are kind of related to this. The purpose today is just to um, try to identify the factors that 
could change or influence an SQL statement's execution plan. Okay, We're not, each of these different factors that come up could be a separate webinar altogether, all by itself. Um, so we're, today, the purpose is really just to identify those. We'll talk about some of those in a little bit of detail, but again, we don't have the time to go into great detail on any particular one topic there, so we, we want to just identify that. You know, the problem we run into is that you know, we, we're executing an SQL statement and it doesn't perform up to our expectations, it doesn't perform up to our service level agreements, and we, we then want to start analyzing that statement, trying to diagnose, troubleshoot where the performance problem is. Without knowing all the different influencing factors, we may miss something. Uh, we know the obvious ones, and it was stated kind of in the definition of this webinar that you may have received by email. Uh, we know the obvious ones like object statistics and indexes have a, a big influence on how the optimizer may choose an execution plan. But there are so many other factors as well. So what we want to look at is, okay, we, we have a poor performing SQL statement, we've run it through maybe the explain plan utility or have gotten an, uh, an execution plan from somewhere else, and we start looking into it, and we look into the statistics look good, the indexes, they seem reasonable, okay, now what? And that's what we kind of want to look at today. So the, the purpose is by the end of the webinar, you have a nice list of um, the majority of the factors that could influence it, so that when you're going down your list, you're saying it's not the statistics, it's not the indexes, it's not this, it's not that. Now what? Then you keep going down your list. Let me check this. Let me check that. And like I said, today is the purpose is, is to develop that list. As we go through the webinar, you may want to keep track of, like I said, any questions you have. And remember, to it's best to kind of just send those to my email address so we can get through the webinar and get the rest of you on your way throughout the rest of your day, back to lunch, back to work, wherever you're heading to. I know this is a very busy time of year. So remember, jmullins at themasync.com. All right, let's jump in here. First, I'm pretty sure most of you, if not all of you, are already familiar with what an execution plan is. Okay, so when we execute an SQL statement, it goes through a number of steps, including a syntax check, a semantic check, making sure the tables are valid, I have privileges to those tables, the columns I'm accessing are valid for those tables, I get their data types, I get privileges you know, in that semantics check, and if I pass the syntax check and the semantic check, then we go on to, has this statement ever been run before? And now we're talking about coming up with an execution plan. If, it, if this statement is already out there in memory in something called the shared pool, then I could use the execution plan that's already there. If not, I have to come up with a new execution plan. And that execution plan is simply just a, a, st a sequence of steps that Oracle is going to execute to perform my statement behind the scenes. Uh, you know, things like, you guys know this, full table scans, index scans, um, what type of join methods, uh, nested loop join, hash join, sort merge join, um, and all kinds of other things that might pop up in there too. So we know, we, I kind of have an idea what that is, but what kind of things influence the optimizer in choosing those plans? And these are the things we'll talk about today, and today's uh, webinar will go for about 30 to 45 minutes or so. Um, the architecture, and we'll see just a little bit of each of these. And so, like I said, the purpose is to develop that list that we want to come up with. So the architecture could have some influence. There are a lot of database parameters, most of which can be issued either at the session level or the system level. And there's a lot of those that I want to go through today. Um, we're most aware about statistics and indexes that might be out there. And of course, there are hints. Um, what about our code? The way that we write our code, could that influence the plan or not? And the, and the answer is sure. Um, and then we have things that go into the optimizer's thinking that maybe we're using and maybe we're not. Things like SQL profiles or SQL baselines. 
And then if you're up to Oracle 12C, if I would throw a little bit of that in here too, there's a feature in there called Adaptive Query Optimization. So we'll talk about that briefly too. So we'll kind of go through each of these categories just briefly. Like I said, we want to identify the list so that when you do go back to work and you are working on an SQL tuning problem, hopefully the list will give you some idea of, of other areas to look at in order to uh, correct that problem that's out there. All right, so we'll start with the architecture. Um, not a whole lot here that we're going to look at with the architecture. However, um, the PGA might be the, the area that has one of the bigger influences on our execution plans. So the PGA is the process global area, sometimes called the program global area. Um, it's an area of memory where um, it keeps track of our connections to the database and to the instance of the database. It um, is also an area, area that's used for temporary workspace. So, so things like sorting, generating statistics, um, creating hash tables for hash joins, uh, things like that. So think about that for a moment. Uh, you know, the size of the PGA can determine and influence the optimizer to choose certain things. For, for example, um, the optimizer, you're doing a join, and the optimizer says, okay, I'm looking at the join, I'm looking at the statistics. Based on the statistics, I kind of like to do a hash join because we're talking about, you know, a high cardinality, high volume of data here. Um, hash tables have to be created in the PGA, or that's ideally where they should be created. And so the optimizer then checks out the size of the PGA, what's available in the PGA, how much each individual process has access to uh, memory in the PGA. Uh, just because you're the only one on the system doesn't mean you get the entire PGA. So there are other parameters that influence that each process gets a maximum amount of space as well. And then based on that, the optimizer may decide, based on those numbers, it really doesn't look like I can get the entire hash table into the PGA like I want to. So he may have to create part of the hash table in memory in the PGA, then he's going off to physical disk space to the temporary table space, back to the PGA, back to the temporary table space, back to the PGA. And he says, if that's going to happen, then maybe a hash join isn't my best option. Maybe I should look at the nested loop join. You know, and what influences him on the nested loop join? Well, he's, he's looking for things like, is there a, an index on the foreign key column that we're doing the join on? Um, is there a, a smaller of the two tables? What's the volume? What's the estimated cardinality? Uh, and you know, if you can't do the hash table in the P, in the uh, PGA, that's why we might get some nested loop decisions in our execution plans for data that's really out of the range for the nested loop, and that's why it's performing poorly. You know, nested loops are best for joining result sets that are fairly small. Hash joins are are more applicable to larger joins of result sets or data or records from tables. So the size of the PGA and how much each individual process gets in the PGA, um, those are things that could be influencing factors there. Um, other things that are done there in the PGA, um, your sorting, say, uh, same thing. So if some s sort of your execution plan requires a sort, um, things like, well, we just mentioned the hash join, but a sort merge join wants to do a sort. Um, and what else does your query have built into it? Does it have distincts? Does it have order buys? The types of joins? All the things that could that uh, area could influence there. So that could be a factor. Um, just the design of our tables in general could be factors on uh, execution plans. You know, are our tables, and this is pretty common, right? Um, especially nowadays with the volume of data that we're keeping within our tables, that partitions um, are pretty common with tables design. So, it, you know, a table with partitions versus a table without partitions, it's the same number of records, it's the same data, 
but the design of the table can influence the execution plan as well. We know that partitions are generally a pretty good thing there. Uh, Exadata has become a pretty popular architecture preference as well um, that could influence execution plans. Those of you that are using Exadata know that you know everything we've already talked about today about the PGA and everything in previous webinars or classes that we talk about the Oracle architecture is still the same except that at the Exadata level down at the hardware level down at the disk level there's also an extra set of memory structures down there and you know based on those combined with the Oracle memory structures you know that can have an influencing factor as well so if you're migrating say from a non exadata to an exadata um, execution plans could change at that point we shouldn't really expect all of them to stay the same so there could be differences some of them could stay the same for sure now in addition to any of those architectural ones there are a lot of parameters that influence execution plans chosen by the optimizer. And this is probably an area that when I teach the SQL optimization class, this is probably an area where most of the students um, aren't aware of all these parameters. You know, they're, the students are typically doing all the same thing. They're, they're running their code through the explain plan utility. They're getting res, uh, information about their code from doing traces, from doing AWR reports, or whatever it might be. But explain plan's a big deal. Um, they know about statistics, they know about indexes, but what about these parameters? So I'm going to go through these uh, fairly quickly and just let you know how they might influence the execution plan that's out there. Um, first one being cursor sharing, and these aren't in any particular order or, or any order of importance. These are just kind of in a random order here for us. Um, cursor sharing allows us to do um, basically default bind variables. So if you're not already explicitly coding default uh, bind variables in your code, um, this will, will allow you to turn it on and convert your code, your SQL, to using bind variables without you having to change your code. Um, by default, it's turned off. Its default value is, is exact, E-X-A-C-T. Um, this gets down to that third step where has this statement ever been run before? If it has, and I match to that statement in memory, I can use the execution plan and avoid a hard parse. If I don't match, I have to do the hard parse. If I do match, I can use the plan and avoid the hard parse. And if this is a statement that's repeated throughout the day, the week, the month, um, I can see some performance gain by avoiding hard parses. You can also set this parameter equal to sharing or force, and that'll allow the default bind variable option to be turned on and so things like where department number equals 30 and where department number equals 20 from two different queries if I turn this particular feature on they will now match each other in the shared pool memory structure and avoid a hard parse there I won't go into too much difference uh, discussion about the differences between sharing and force but um, both of those will turn on this particular feature. So it turns on default bind variables, which can help us avoid um, unnecessary hard parses. All right, um, DB file multi-block read count. Okay, and that's a long one. Um, that, that one helps influence the optimizer between choosing between full table scans and some sort of an index scan. The higher that parameter is, the more likely the optimizer might choose a full table scan. Um, this, this value is set to some integer type value, like 128, for example, or 256, or 512. And what that number represents is the, the number of database blocks that have to be, that can be read, I should say, in a single I.O. So when he's comparing so I'm looking at this query, what should I do? Should I do a full table scan on this table or some sort of an index scan? Um, well, let me check it out, how much I.O. each one might need. Well, with a full table scan, I can read uh, 256 blocks in a single I.O. 
if I do an index range scan, I can read one block at a time. So which one, which, which one will read fewer blocks? And that goes into his thinking there. So the higher this one is, the more likely we do full table scans. The lower it is, we're trying to push him towards uh, index type scans. And so that can influence his choice. Um, same thing with optimizer mode. You know, it defaults to all rows, and a lot of you know that, especially the DBAs out there. So we're trying to tell the optimizer, when you're coming up with your plan, this is the type of um, environment, the type of behavior we want you to consider. You know, all rows is best throughput. There's another one called first rows. That's getting the data back, the first data back quickly, but maybe the overall data won't come for some time. So it depends on the application. All rows is really good for... Oops, all rows is really good for um, batch type jobs, things like that. Let me switch my screen back over here. It got uh, there we go. Should pop up there on there for a second. There we go. Um, batch jobs um, are good for all rows. I interactive kind of applications during the day where people are, are bringing stuff up on a screen. Um, first rows might be better. And you know, first rows tells us influences him to do maybe maybe more nested loop joins. All rows tells him, influences him maybe to do more hash joins. So that one can have some influencing factor. Um, two of them that we talk about a lot in our classes are the optimizer index caching and the optimizer index cost adjustment, these next two here, the items four and five. Um, the optimizer index caching defaults to a value of zero, um, which means this is telling the optimizer when he's thinking, hmm, should I use an index of some sort or should I do a full table scan? The zero indicates to him all indexes, just like any other flavor of data, are stored up in memory on the server as well. The zero says that you have a very little chance of finding the index you want in memory. Okay. It, the index caching parameter can go from 0 to 100. 100 being there's a really good chance the index you want is in memory. And that would influence him towards what? Using an index maybe, at least thinking about it. So 0 is kind of low, but that's the default. It says you're not going to find what you want in memory. You're going to have to go to disk first, put it in memory, and then you can use it. Um, so that influences him maybe towards more full table scans. But there's way too many other influencing factors. Not One factor is not going to influence him one way or another. The second one's even a little bit more powerful, this optimizer index cost adjustment. Um, that's basically telling the optimizer its default is set to 100. That basically tells the optimizer that the cost of using an index versus the cost of using a full table scan are the same if it's set to 100. So in other words, if I have the indexes in place and I'm looking at the plans the optimizer is choosing and he's not choosing my indexes for some reason, I may want to look at this parameter, the cost adjustment parameter. Um, it's just like when you buy anything else out in the real world. The price of something influences a lot of people on which product to buy. Same thing here. So if I lower the cost adjustment from 100 down to, let's say, 30 or 20 or 10, that's telling the optimizer that the indexes have a lower cost, they're more efficient for maybe this type of operation, and trying to influence him to actually use an index and change his mind on what he ends up with in his final execution plan. There are a lot of um, Oracle performance type of authors out there in the world that write reference books, that do blogs on the internet or whatever, and a lot of them will agree that this cost adjustment, it should be lowered. Um, you really don't need to monkey around with any of these. If the opt optimizer is choosing the index that you think it should choose and your performance is acceptable, there's no reason to lower it. You only want to lower these if, in this case the cost adjustment parameter, if the op the optimizer is having a hard time choosing indexes and your performance is not what you it should be. 
All right, there are a couple of um, parameters here that are that are related to some of the Oracle 11G new features, like the invisible indexes and the pending statistics. So some of you know from 11G that you can create what's called an invisible index. And you can test that within your own session without affecting other users. If it's invisible um, for other users, then the optimizer, when they run their code, doesn't consider using that invisible index. But within your session, you can tell the optimizer to consider or use invisible indexes. Maybe you're testing a new index and see what the impact might be. What you don't want to do is a lot of these parameters, like I mentioned, they can be set up at the system level for everybody or at the session level. So typically you don't want to, say, create, use the set this parameter, use invisible indexes. You don't want to set it to true at the system level, for example. Uh, we'll set it true at the session level. We'll test our indexes, run them through explain plan, run them through our other tests, see what the impact is, and if we like it, then we'll make that invisible index visible. Um, the influencing factor there is if you set it true at the system level, then the optimizer might be considering some of these test in indexes when he really shouldn't be, and he may be coming up with different plans than expected there. So we want to be careful about that. Plus, if we are using invisible indexes at the session level and we find out that, hey, this is a good index, I want to make it available to everybody, don't forget to make it visible. Because now you, you, you may think that everybody else, including the optimizer, has access to this index and you're looking at the execution plans thinking, he's still not using my index. Well, it's because you didn't make it visible, right? It's a forgetful thing. Pending statistics are very similar to that. You know, a lot of people are afraid of updating or generating new up-to-date accurate statistics because it know, they know it could change the execution plan for a particular statement the next time it's executed. So Oracle introduced these, this pending statistics feature in 11G, which um, allows us to test, just like the invisible indexes, at the session level, what's the impact if the statistics change. And then if... If uh, everything is okay and the impact is positive, then we can make then we can publish those pen, pending statistics for everybody else to use. But that can have an influencing factor also. Um, at the end of this webinar, we'll talk about um, SQL plan baselines and SQL profiles. Um, but there is a parameter for the optimizer to consider SQL plan baselines. Um, it's set to true by default, the plan baselines is. The invisible indexes and the pending statistics are both set to false, but the plan baseline set to true. We'll talk more about that when we get to that section here in the webinar. A few more here just before we finish up the parameter part. Um, optimizer dynamic sampling. Um, what happens when we present an SQL statement to execute? The optimizer is coming up with an SQL plan, execution plan and there's missing statistics for some reason. All right, by default in 11G is going to do dynamic sampling and based on the level of the dynamic sampling um, he's going to try to generate some temporary statistics which aren't stored anywhere. They're only used for this particular execution of the statement. Okay, so the, the, the higher or the lower of that parameter setting, if you set it to zero, the dynamic sampling is turned off but that can have an influence as well. Um, <clears throat> one other thing we talk about a lot is that in Oracle, we, we mentioned the memory structures quite a bit as being kind of an influencing a factor on performance. Um, not necessarily, though, for execution plan influences, but just on performance in general. Um, there is an area called the result cache in Oracle 11G. By default, Oracle doesn't really store results of queries in the database for a persistent period of time. So once your query is done, the results are done. That cursor gets released in memory for some other cursor to use. Um, with the result cache, it's kind of like a materialized view in memory only. So I know many of you have used materialized views before. 
Um, and these parameters here can turn on the result cache feature either at the session level or the system level. Uh, what the result cache is is kind of like a materialized view. If I run a query that typically reads a lot of data but produces a small result set, particularly if I'm using like functions or aggregates, count, max, min, sum, average, whatever, or my own functions, uh, um, with the result cache, I can actually store the result in memory. It's part of the shared pool. And uh, next time I run the query, if the data that went into the result hasn't changed, instead of reading the raw data that went into the calculation of the result, I can just read the result. So instead of reading a million records, I could read, in an extreme case, just one. And that sounds a lot faster, right? And you can see wh whether or not the optimizer is using the result cache in your execution plan output. So whether or not th this is turned on or off, or if you're doing it at the session level, you can do it at the statement level too with a result cache uh, hint. Um, you can see it in the execution plan. So whether or not you have this turned on, whether or not you're using the hint, it'll influence the optimizer either to use the result cache or to use the raw data. Um, a couple of other ones there at the bottom. Um, the optimizer features enable. There's obviously certain features within each version of Oracle, with the, within each release of each version of Oracle that uh, can, can matter. For example, the adaptive query optimization requires the optimizer feature enable to be set to at least Oracle 12.1 in order for that feature to be turned on. So depending on what value you have that set to, um, it can have an influencing factor on your execution plan and the way that they look. Uh, the query rewrite enabled by default is set to true. Okay, that has to do with those materialized views. That has to do with the result cache. So that when you issue a query, um, if that's set to true, any features that allow the optimizer to rewrite your query behind the scenes, um, that can have an influencing factor on the execution plan as well. If that's turned on, which that's the default. Okay, so you can see that between these last two pages, there are a lot of parameters, both at the session level and or system level, that can influence the optimizer one way or another when the optimizer is trying to figure out what plan should I use. All right, let's go on to the next category here. All right, statistics and indexes. I won't spend a lot of time on this because this is the one most people are familiar with. We know that the optimizer looks at statistics to see and get an idea of how much data am I, are we talking about here. Uh, he's trying to use and consider st uh, indexes just like you would uh, index in the back of a reference book. So those all influence the optimizer and his plan one way or another, as do histograms for so we can see the distribution of the data. You know, what percentage of the data is department 20 versus what percentage of the data is department 30? Is it an even distribution? Is it an uneven distribution? That can influence the optimizer one way or another as far as choosing what execution plans out there. And then in Oracle 11G, there's those invisible indexes again down at the bottom and the pending statistics. But that also introduced extended statistics for us in 11G. Um, by default, when we create statistics, say, on a table and on indexes, all those statistics are based upon a single object, a single table, a single column. Even if your index is made up of multiple columns, the optimizer only sees, let's say we have an index based on department number and job title. The index only sees the statistics for department number alone and it sees the statistics for job title alone, not the combination of the two. So there is a new feature in 11G. Um, some of you, I'm sure, have used it. Some, some of you maybe not. Called extended statistics where we can, with the DBMS stats package, there's some new programs in there in 11G, create statistics on the combination of fields rather than just individual fields, which is what we get by default. And that can have a, a, a good influence as well. For example, if he's choosing single column indexes and not multi-column indexes for some reason, or 
we can use the extended statistics can also be used for what if I have something like where upper E name equals Smith and there's an index, a B tree index on E name. By default, if that's just a regular B tree index, it'll get ignored, but I can create an extended statistics on not just E name, but on upper E name. And that can help influence the optimizer to maybe choose some of your function based indexes more often. All right, what about hints? A lot of debate around hints, right? You'll see everything from um, I go to different places and they use hints as their first line of defense in tuning anything. They'll add a hint on there and a hint's just a suggestion or a directive to the optimizer on how they should process, how it should process your statement. Um, other, other documentation on hints, including information that comes from internal Oracle Corporation people will say hints are fine, but if you can find a, a better way other than a hint, a more persistent way other than a hint, maybe use a hint further down the line or as a last resort type of thing. So you get lots of debates one way or another on those, but we use a hint kind of as a, it looks like a comment in an SQL statement if you haven't used it before. And some of the common ones are listed here. We can use an index hint or a leading hint or ordered hint to kind of tell the optimizer what order to do process our tables in. Um, do we want to do any sort of parallel processing? Sometimes that's done by default, but sometimes we have to kind of suggest it to the optimizer. A pen gives us that direct path um, type behavior, especially if we're doing an insert type statement, maybe with a subquery. And then if we're trying to influence the optimizer to use certain join methods, like a hash join or nested loop join. There's some hints for that too. But there are hundreds of hints. You know, and even if Oracle tells us or discourages us from using them, there are still hundreds of them. And if you look out in the shared pool at all the SQL code that's being run, including Oracle's code that's being run so that we can process our own code, Oracle uses their own fair number of hints as well, even though they could discourage us not to. Uh, a hint, you know, a well-written hint um, is something that the optimizer should heavily consider and a lot of times will choose. Um, but there's no 100% guarantee. It could be very close to 100%. He might choose your hint for two years and then all of a sudden there might be something that changes and now it doesn't use your hint. That's why Oracle in general will suggest if you can find a permanent solution to your performance problem, then that's great. It, you may put a hint on it temporarily until you can find a better solution, if there is one. If there's not a better solution, maybe a hint is the only solution. But again, it can have a big influencing factor on the execution plan that your optimizer chooses. All right, how about your code? And we're almost through all these here. Um, depending on how you write your code, could influence the execution plan too. Um, we know that there are certain things that will negate index usage in your code, right? whether you're doing not equals, you have row functions in there, um, you're doing implicit conversions in places where you don't need to do implicit conversions or shouldn't be doing implicit conversions. Um, that will cause the optimizer, basically in some cases say, well, based on your code, I have no choice. I've got to do a full table scan. And so your code will influence him to choose that. And, and he's sitting there saying, man, I wish I could use that index, but I can't based on the way you wrote your code. You know, things like union versus union all, uh, those types of things, those set operators, if you can avoid sorts and you can see the sorts being done in your execution plan, then avoid the sort by all means, right? You all know that. Um, and then there are, we know that there's different ways to get the same result. Um, a lot of our classes, we talk about that, and we kind of have to, in some cases, think out of the box. You know, some of us are subquery people, some of us are join people, some of us can do either one. Some of us, when we get, get presented a problem, we always do it the same way. We, we always do it with a join, or we always do it with a subquery. Um, what we have to be aware of is if 
we come up with a join method, and maybe it's an anti-join, and a left or right outer join type thing, um, and it doesn't perform well, and we go through our normal steps of running it through the ex explain plan utility and looking at statistics and looking at join methods, those types of things. Eventually, we may run out of items on our list, and we still don't, it's still not performing well. Well, the solution might be to rewrite it a different way. And that will cause the optimizer to come up with a different plan because the statement's different. But that different plan could also be faster. So sometimes we can do an anti-join, for example. You know, we do this all the time. We do an anti-join, left or right outer join, and get a solution. But we could also do a non-correlated subquery and get the same thing. Or we could do a correlated subquery and get the same thing. Or we could use a set operator like minus and get the same thing. You know, we might be trying to solve a simple problem like, show me all the departments that don't have any employees. All those different methods on the screen there, I can solve that problem with any of those methods. And some of them will be faster than the others. Now, we have to know a lot about each of those methods to know which one might be faster. Like a set operator, like minus, if I do a select and then a minus and then a select, a minus has to do a sort because it's going to throw out duplicates, and that might be the killing part of that in that execution plan, whereas maybe the non-correlated um, doesn't have to do a sort, or the anti-join, if it's nested loop, doesn't have to do a sort. So we have to kind of be aware of, are, is there another way I could write this that might be the only way to get the optimizer to choose a different plan, and hopefully a better plan too. All right, last three items here, um, SQL profiles. And we, like I said, we could do a whole session on just profiles or baselines. But an SQL profile is just a set of additional statistics and information available to the optimizer on top of the table statistics and indexes statistics to help the optimizer choose a better plan. So profiles come from the SQL Tuning Advisor, and that can be an automatic thing or that can be a manual thing. Um, sometimes, for those of you that have run the SQL Tuning Advisor before, what these advisors do is they give you recommendations, they give you advice, and one of their recommendations might be, hey, I created an SQL profile for you that should improve your performance, will change your execution plan, um, do you want to implement it or not? And so we can do that. There's a package called dbms underscore SQL tune. We can use that to create SQL profiles. An SQL profile gets tied directly to a certain piece of code that you're running, whatever statement that that is, and the SQL profile is stored in the database. So the next time that statement is run, the optimizer in his considerations will say, hmm, is there a profile for the statement? Ah, oh, there is. Well, let me use that additional information to help me come up with maybe estimating the cardinality of different steps of the process, which might change my mind on how I'm going to run uh, or come up with my execution plan. And there's, of course, a data dictionary view called DBA underscore SQL profiles. We can see what profiles are out there. Okay, so that's just additional information for the optimizer, which could cause the optimizer to change his plan or not. All right? SQL plan baselines are different, and then these two things are individual of each other. They're not, they, they can be used together or separately. It doesn't matter. One of our biggest fears from day to day is for particular statements that we've had problems with in the past and now we've got them tuned that for some reason today their plan changes and it changes for the worse. We, if we have a good plan, we want to stick with a good plan. So what we can do is we can create what's called an SQL plan baseline and in that baseline it keeps, you can add to that baseline the plans that are acceptable. Okay, and the way we turn this on, there's some parameters down there you see. There's an optimizer capture SQL plan baselines, which we can set to true. We just set that to true. We run our code. It creates some baselines for all the code that we run until we turn that back to false. 
And then there's another parameter called optimizer use SQL plan baselines. Use SQL plan baselines. Its default is true, so if you have baselines already in place, it'll start using them automatically. What that does is, if you run your statement today, and for some reason today, it came up with a, a new plan uh, because of something that's changed. Maybe the statistics were generated, maybe uh, a table definition changed or something, but the plan changed today. So he's going to look in the plan baseline to say, is the new plan, is it better or worse than the old plan? If it's worse than the old plan, then he's going to use the old plan. Okay? If it's better than the old plan, then he has an algorithm that he uses based on resources used, um, CPU, I.O., whatever. If the new plan is at least the minimum it is target is 3%, what he might think is 3% better than the old plan, then he'll implement the new plan, add it to the baseline. And the baseline could be multiple plans. And it could be acceptable plans in the baseline. There could be unaccepted plans in the baseline. You can see those in the view DBA SQL plan baseline. So this, this hopefully uh, allows us to achieve what's called um, SQL plan um, consistency. So that we don't have to worry about our plans getting worse just all of a sudden when we wake up on a cold day, right? So these can have an influencing factor, uh, what execution plan the optimizer chooses as well. And then the last item, and this is a lot of stuff, and like I said, each one of these could be a separate topic for a, a separate webinar, is in 12C there's a new feature called Adaptive Query Optimization. That allows the optimizer, um, he chooses an execution plan, but when he chooses the execution plan under this feature, he also chooses some alternative plans as well, kind of like a backup plan. And what that allows the optimizer to do is in the middle of the execution of the statement, he's gathering additional uh, statistics while the statement is running on the fly, and he's comparing those statistics to the, uh, the statistics he used when he came up with the original plan, and if they vary greatly between values there, he'll use one of the backup plans to finish the query. Okay, this just has to be Oracle 12.1, Oracle Release 1 or later in order to take advantage of this. It's kind of like, you know, I'm going to walk to lunch today. It looks like rain. Should I take an umbrella or not? Um, I'll take it, but I'm not going to use it. So my original plan is don't use the umbrella, but my alternative plan is I have the umbrella in my backpack. Same thing here. So when it generates the original plan, he comes up with also alternative plans at the same time. And the big difference is when it's running, he's actually generating new statistics. He's not storing them anywhere, but he's generating new statistics, um, storing them in memory, we'll say that much. And then we'll compare them to the uh, existing statistics at the time it, it was kicked off for execution and if there's a difference of a certain percentage then he'll change plans uh, potentially so that can have an influence on your plan changing right in the middle of an execution of all things so that you know of course is fairly new we'll kind of see as time progresses through Oracle 12 release 1 release 2 and so on, if this plan sounds really good, this new feature does, we'll, we'll see it over time if it uh, performs as advertised, right? <clears throat> All right, and you can see there just what I just mentioned there. Compares new statistics to existing statistics or old statistics, changes the plan. All right, that takes us to the end there. Now, there were a lot of things, and I remember the idea of this webinar today was a little bit different than other ones. The idea today was to generate a list of, of factors that we can you know, document so that when we are tuning our statements and we're not getting the plans we want, what other things may have went into the plan to influence it the way that it did. So we can then start checking those out in more details there. So there are quite a few of there for us to look at. 
um, beyond today, if you have any questions about any of those items there, send me an email at jmullins at femasinc.com. Um, there is another webinar coming up in January for, for the DB2 people out there, so spread the word. If you're also a DB2 pre person, great. If you know some other DB2 people there at work, let, let them know that on January 5th, uh, there will also be a, a nice tuning webinar for the DB2 side of the house titled DB2 SQL Tuning Tips for Developers. And again, you can go out to themasinc.com slash webinars and you should be able to see that out there and be able to sign up for it out there. Otherwise, expect to see some uh, emails that come around with that sign-up information, registration information in there. Also, remember you can get more information at themasinc.com. You can contact some of you know John Kakaval. You could send him an email about uh, you know future webinars if you want if, if you want to suggest some topics or um, for training as well. Um, today's webinar, the slides and a recorded presentation of today's webinar will be out at themasync.com slash webinars. Just give us a little bit of time to put it out there. So you may won't be out there right away. Um, it has to be formatted and such, but you can go out there and get a copy of it and uh, share it with some of your coworkers if you like. Other than that, I know it's a busy time of the year. Thank you for attending today. Have a good uh, end of the year. And, you know, January is right around the corner. So thank you again for attending. I appreciate it very much. Uh, good luck in your tuning endeavors down the road. And if you have any questions, remember to send me an email at jmullins at themasync.com. All right, have a good day. And I hope to see you again soon in a webinar or a training class here at Themis.